Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we've got a special guest and that's Daniel, the CEO of Invictus Capital. So how are you going, Daniel? Hi, it's uh, great to be here. Thanks for joining us. Time zone differences, I think you're in South Africa at the moment, is that right? Or? We are, yeah, GMT plus two, so awesome. 11 a.m., but uh, yeah, it's good. So you guys manage the Crypto 20 Index Fund, which we're going to talk about, and you're also launching another fund, which we're going to mention as well. But um, what's your background? Mm-hmm. How did you get into crypto and what led to the, the Crypto 20 Fund? So originally, um, I got involved in crypto around 2010. Um, a friend of mine who was really into InfoSec um, had come up you know, upon Bitcoin and uh, was trying to convert, you know, all of his friends to get into it. Um, I thought it was a really interesting um, concept and the community back then was really different. It was kind of just crypto anarchists and um, guys that were involved in in InfoSec generally um, trying to come up with this new, you know, disruptive payment methodology. But um, so we, we got involved in mining it back then. Um, I remember mining about one Bitcoin a day, um, but it was worth only around a dollar a day back then. So, you know, it, it didn't really give us any um, lasting benefit, I guess. So we, we kind of left it and decided instead of having our graphics cards run 24 hours a day, we'd, you know, play StarCraft or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and then um, how did that lead into the fund and getting people to invest in those top 20 assets and how does that fund work in terms of what it invests in and rebalancing? So we had a, um, I started the world's first licensed Bitcoin sportsbook and casino around 2014. And um, from there, that was acquired by Cloudbet in um, Hong Kong. And um, we decided essentially to look at what exists in the real financial world and uh, what could be replicated into you know, the Bitcoin world. Um, a lot of these kind of products already existed in terms of you know, the infrastructure. And um, after some investigation, we realized there isn't actually any um, you know, real financial services products. There was no index fund at the time. And investing obviously in something as volatile as Bitcoin or crypto in general, uh, one thing you can do to try and protect your capital is to diversify. Um, So that was the general thesis behind uh, developing an index fund. Obviously, holding it in a single token is is much easier for people than, you know, having 20 in their wallet, which is also kind of untenable. Um, And we use data science to determine the optimal parameters. you know, the number of coins in the fund, how often it's rebalanced, um, and the asset cap, which is 10%. Awesome. For, I'll just bring it up on screen quickly for people that aren't aware, but the Crypto20 or C20 sure. token um, has these 20 assets here, guys, and the percentage terms. I think the max weight's 10%, so at the moment, mm-hmm. there's a couple that are slightly over that, and they'll get rebalanced at the end of the month. Um, anything else to add to that? Daniel, it's pretty basic in how it works, but it um, actually saves people that maybe don't want to do that all themselves um, a fair bit of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we keep all the assets in cold storage. It's only what's necessary to be moved to exchange during the rebalance period. Um, and so far, it has outperformed both Bitcoin and the total crypto market cap. Uh, we just released our second quarterly report yesterday, so the fund's been operational for full six months now. Um, and another benefit um, that people might often overlook is that we do stake uh, the relevant coins, proof of stake coins in the top 20 for you. And um, for example, to stake Dash, um, that does cost, you know, uh, around a million dollars worth of Dash. Um, so it's not something that, you know, an average investor um, would be able to do by themselves. But, you know, obviously by investing in this index fund, it, it gives you the benefit of that. Um, so we stake Neo, um, Dash and uh, Stellar. And um, we also collect and claim and sell all the relevant forks that come in. So all of that income is generated for the fund. Yeah, I mean, we're going to talk about um, legislation a bit later, but that's almost like a, a dividend paying fund on top of the fastest growing asset class in the world. So pretty attractive for people. Um, the next question I had was in regards to managed funds and index funds. So 
it's a trend that we'll talk about how it works in the crypto space, but just in general, are you noticing that people are sort of saying, well, hold on, why am I paying all these fees when we can get good index funds now? And what are the fees for the crypto 20 fund? So our fees are only 0.5% per annum uh, compared to the average competitor in the market, which is charging something like 3%, um, which goes all the way up to, I mean, if you're looking at a hedge fund style crypto fund, which is in general, if you're a regular accredited investor and you're investing with cash, fiat and uh, US dollars, um, generally the fee structure is that of a hedge fund, which is 2% annual management fees and 20% performance fees, yeah. which can be quite quite significant. Um, and our fees of just 0.5% per annum, I think exemplifies our you know goal to be the vanguard of crypto. Um, you know, we want to offer a diverse range of low cost funds that, you know, aren't exploitative just because people want to get into crypto now um, and that we offer real value. Even just the staking and the forks in the last quarter exceeded the, the management fees. And no exit fees or no brokerage fees either, I believe. Yeah, fantastic. Do you notice that a lot of people sort of go chasing those new altcoins and ICOs a little bit? Now, you guys are launching a new fund to try and now, give people exposure to the best ICOs and that has a number of benefits for the little guy that can't even get access to pools and whatever. But do you think for someone that's just getting started, they often overlook that this space is still very early and just having skin in the game in the top 20, you know, might perform better than someone that tries and pick random coins that all end up, you know, failing in the future? Yeah, the diverse approach is is generally best. I mean, uh, risk adjusted it, I mean, even without the risk adjustment, it outperforms Bitcoin in the total market cap. Yeah. Um, but when you're looking at all the individual coins and you're trying to take a bet, obviously taking a bet across you know, a wider range of essentially startups, um, ICOs are. Yeah. So if you're investing in startups in the traditional venture capital space um, and you look at their model, you know, they invest in 100 and only expect one to really make it. And um, that kind of makes their whole fund. So I don't think that we should expect it to be too different with ICOs, but um, in general, you can get liquidity earlier on and uh, you can even get, you know, sort of an, an exit to your investment at a profit um, soon after listing in some cases, yeah. which is quite different from uh, traditional venture capital. So there are quite a few benefits um, to just investing in tokens. And the new fund that you're launching, I think the tick is um, IHF, the Hyperion fund, that's going to have more of a focus mm -hmm. on those ICOs. And we've now got, I think the stat was a thousand ICOs a month that are now launching. So how do you guys, what's the process to look for the best ones? So we've, we've got a couple of proprietary tools um, that we utilize. And we've obviously done a lot of data science work um, based on, you know, which industries uh, perform the best in terms of raise and uh, performance after the ICO. Uh, we've also got the free Titan AI tool, which was uh, developed to allow people to upload white papers and um, identify if there is any plagiarized content. So every time somebody uploads a white paper, it gets added to our corpus of documents and um, it searches through all the other documents and it can find um, instances of plagiarism. It doesn't have to be identical text. It can be you know, very similar phrases. Uh, synonyms, etc., and the uh, machine learning algorithm will pick that up. Fantastic. So our general, our general process uh, for identifying the ICO is um, obviously looking at the team, uh, the commercials behind it, the deal. Um, we often try and negotiate for a percentage of raise uh, as opposed to just tokens and a bonus on the tokens to mitigate risk, especially in this kind of a market. Um, and if it's in a serious uh, kind of dip, uh, as we are at the moment, um, we often look for ICOs or pre-sales um, that are denominated in, in that currency in Bitcoin or ETH, because even if we invest in Bitcoin or ETH, it's not, you know, uh, an immediate loss on that sort of crypto that we're holding. If, you know, ETH triples in price, it doesn't uh, affect us at all. Yeah. And just in general, in the, the market, what stage do you think we're at? And also in the ICO market, I know in the pre-interview was saying that the amount that funds are raising has actually increased the last few months, so things are on the rise? Yeah, in general, I think um, things are maturing quite a bit. People are looking towards uh, more serious projects, and I don't think it's as easy to kind of get away with just a white paper um, nowadays. I think the investors are demanding 
you know, formal legal structures. They're demanding the team to be, you know, present and accountable. Um, and for there to be some kind of MVP, um, it definitely gives people a bit of peace of mind if they see that there is some sort of working product yeah. um, that they can test out. Now, we're going to talk about, um, you know, regulation. It's a pretty hot topic at the moment, particularly for ICOs. So, have you guys found it, um, you know, in, in Australia, for example, do you need the appropriate AFSL or how's that regulation work in each different jurisdiction? It, it varies quite a bit um, based on, you know, every country's security laws, essentially. Um, in the Cayman Islands where we're domiciled, um, a token would have to confer equity rights to be considered a security, uh, regardless of what method it uses to, you know, pay out, uh, whether that be dividends or, you know, buying and burning, et cetera. Yeah. So as, um, you know, in general, tokens don't confer equity rights, um, these tokens are all considered utility tokens in, in the Cayman's jurisdiction. Obviously that, you know, varies country by country, like in the US, it might be considered a security. Um, and as such, you just need to be quite careful of, uh, you know, which citizens you do allow into your ICO. Yeah. But once it's freely trading, there's no, um, you know, on a decentralized exchange or a centralized exchange, you know, a US investor could still buy that then and it's up to them or how does that side of things sort of work? They could, but they can't redeem it directly through us. A US okay. investor wouldn't, wouldn't be able to um, access the liquidation function. Uh, they need to KYC for that and we, we wouldn't um, process the KYC of US citizens. So in terms of redemption, um, as a, you know, with a traditional ETF, um, they wouldn't be able to to access that functionality. Awesome. Well, Wayne, I've enjoyed chatting today. Any final thoughts? How far away is that fund? We'll put all the links in the description go, um, below, guys, if you want more details. So the Invictus Hyperion Fund is um, the ICO is, is, is complete. We're launching on exchanges um, most likely next month. So we'll be be announcing that. Yeah, the Crypto Twenty Quarterly Report, uh, second quarterly report, is now available. Um, on, on our medium. Um, so that's medium.crypto20.com. And uh, we'll be you know, releasing further information about our investments in the Hyperion Fund. We've currently got three, I think, DAB, Lightstreams, and uh, Noya. And uh, we've got quite a few more coming up um, that we'll you know, sort of release our DD reports, due diligence reports about um, before listing on exchange. So I think things are generally looking exciting. I'm definitely looking forward to the SEC's decision um, on August 10th about the Bitcoin ETF, because if that does come through, then that's uh, definitely a very bullish signal. I'd expect to see some, some solid gains if that, uh, if that was the case. I agree. Fingers crossed. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Daniel. I hope we uh, talk again in the future. Yeah, thank you. Cheers, man.